Hello and welcome to Byju's exam prep IAS. Let's get started and look into the first article. The first article says, what is the controversy over GST Levi's on food? Let us try and understand what is this article all about. There are a number of food items that we consume every single day. This includes curd, lassi, buttermilk, puffed rice, wheat, pulses, oats, maize, flour. These items were exempted from the GST bracket, that is no taxes were imposed on them. However, the government according to the recent notification, which was as discussed by the GST council, has said that about 5% of the GST tax rate will be imposed on all these products. So from July 18th, a 5% goods and service tax has been levied on several food items and grains that are sold in a pre-packed, labelled form even if they are not branded. As a result, because the government is imposing about 5% of GST on these food items and grains, you have number of people criticizing the GST council for such a decision. It is in this particular backdrop, we have to understand why did the GST council go ahead with this imposition and we will also have to understand the concerns with respect to the consumers. First up, we have to understand different tax rates for different kinds of products. When we look into the 5% bracket, we have the packed foods like milk, curd and paneer, unpacked foods, rice and wheat, when packed and bank fee for issuing checks, dried leguminous vegetables, makhana, wheat or the miscellaneous flour, jaggery, puffed rice, organic food, manure and compost, ostomy appliances and transport of goods and passengers by ropeways, electric vehicles, whether or not fitted with the battery pack. For these, what the GST council has decided is an imposition of 5% tax. Then we have the 12% taxes, hotels charging rupees 1000 or less per day for the stay, solar water heaters, finished goods like leather products, maps and charts including atlases, renting of drug, goods carriage where the cost of fuel is included earlier it was under 18%. Now if we look into the 18% bracket, we will have printing, writing and drawing ink, LED lamps, drawing instruments, tetra packets, services such as work contracts for roads, bridges, railways, metro, effluent treatment plants as well as crematoriums. These are the brackets under which taxes will be imposed as per the GST council. Now the question is, when you go back to the year 2017, that was when the GST was introduced. And after 2017, reforms after reforms have been introduced as well. But the government of India and the GST council also appointed two groups as well, two committees as well. These committees were to rationalize what should be the GST rates that will be imposed on different products. So one, there was a committee that was appointed to rationalize the tax structures as well as the correct the anomalies. So basically, this particular committee will look into which product should fall under which bracket, which product should have 5%, which product should have 12%, which product should have 18%, so on and so forth. So there was one committee that was appointed where this particular committee will basically look at rationalizing the tax rate. Then there was another committee which was appointed to tap the technology to improve the compliance. As of now, there are a lot of impediments, lot of obstructions when it comes to following the guidelines as given by the GST. So why not come up with a technological update so that the compliance becomes easier. So there were two groups, one for the rationalization of the tax rate, the other happens to be the technology that the government of India will have to bring up so that there is compliance. So these two committees were appointed and now we have one of the committees which has given an interim report of the first ministerial group that was led by Karnataka Chief Minister Basavaraj Bumai where they have come up with this particular idea of tax rationalization. So we have the GST council which includes the central government as well as the state government officials. They have now decided that we should be imposing these brackets on different kinds of products. Why have the rate changes been undertaken right now? That is because since the introduction of GST in July 2017, several rate revisions have been undertaken affecting the revenue stream which got worsened by the pandemic. So the first reason is we introduced the GST in 2017. So when we introduced the GST, what we were expecting is either we have to have same amount of taxes that are collected 
or we can also have increase in the tax revenue but of late because of the pandemic because of multiple issues surfacing in the economics of the country tax slabs were reduced and we were not getting the expected revenue that was expected from the tax structure as a result to revamp to make sure that we have the same tax revenue like before the government has made sure that introduces these changes into the tax structure why the 5% why the 12% why 18% why these products have been bought under the tax rate that is because the government feels that as of now we do not have enough revenue we did think of one particular revenue during 2017 we are not able to improvise on it so to improvise on it or at least to make sure that we have enough revenue the government has taken this particular idea the second pointer says revenue trend dipping below the revenue neutral rate levels what do we mean by revenue neutral rate levels as the very name denotes it is revenue neutral rate levels whenever a government is coming up with a new reform let's say for example the tax reform what was happening before you had the central government which was imposing its own taxes state government which was imposing its own taxes so what we had is the conflicting viewpoints what we had is super imposing tax rates as well so there were overlapping tax rates as well in order to overcome this what the government introduced was the goods and the service tax this was the uniform taxation both for the central as well as the state so before the gst was introduced the governments of the state governments as well as the central government was generating certain revenue let's hypothetically assume that this revenue was about 1 lakh crore so this was the revenue that both the central government and state governments was expecting and it was deriving but after gst is coming into picture the same amount of revenue should also be there so revenue neutral basically means before the reform we had so and so revenue even after the reform we need to have same amount of revenue it should not fall down but instead the revenue can rise the committee headed by the then chief economic advisor arvind subramanyam was of the view that the range of revenue neutral rate should be between 15 to 15 15.5% center and the states combined a 2019 report by the reserve bank of india had noted that the rationalization of rates by the gst council has brought down the effective weighted average gst rate from 14.4% at the time of inception to about 11.6% this basically means we are not generating enough amount of revenue which is why the government of india has now decided that we have to rationalize it so that we are able to generate enough amount of revenue the third pointer is rate rationalization to correct the inverted duty structure what do we understand by it an inverted duty structure basically arises when the taxes on the output or final product are lower than the taxes on the input this basically creates an inverse accumulation of input tax credit which in most cases has to be refunded for sectors such as mobiles and footwear inverted duty structure has resulted in refunds which is amounting to about 5500 crore to about 2000 crores for the mobiles as well as the footwear to prevent this inverted duty structure the government of india feels that we have to rationalize this tax structure which is why they have taken this initiative and finally there were also concerns regarding disputes and revenue leakages which led to the withdrawal of exemptions of the pre packaged items some companies were seen to be misusing the provision of exempting unlabeled food items what do we mean by it we have the branded items we also have the unlabeled items as well so for the branded items the government was imposing certain taxes what did these branded item companies do so instead of selling it as the branded item what were they doing they were selling their product as unlabeled item so earlier this particular product was sold as the branded item tax rates were imposed but then the company realizes that they are not able to make enough amount of profit so with a similar name having a similar name they came up with the unlabeled product of the very same company so this ultimately meant the tax that the government was supposed to collect it was not able to collect and as a result the government suffered the losses as well for instance it is also learned that there were concerns that the branded rice manufacturer was selling items with a similarly sounding label but not registered as a brand 
and hence was selling under the exempted category. So basically, the government was suffering the revenue loss, which is why the government decides these are the possible reasons. So we have to include so and so product under such and such tax rates. What will be the impact on the consumers? If you look at the LED lamps or if you look at wheat, so on and so forth, these are brought under such and such tax rates. As a result, the consumers will face the pinch of the price rise and at the same time, this can also result in inflationary concerns. So on one side, consumers will have to shell out more money and this may also further increase inflationary tens as well. And when you look at the hotels charging rupees 1000 or less per day for stay, it has been important post under 12% this basically means the tourism sector will also be hit in the non metro cities but the overall retail inflation rate based on the consumer price index is unlikely to get affected sharply as the weightage of these items is low in the index what has the central government said on the issue the finance minister has clarified the gst council includes the center as well as the states only because the states also consider only because they were also on the consensus which is why we have taken this initiative so the 5% she said was critical to curb tax leakages were not taken by one member of the GST council alone as all the states had agreed to the move says the finance minister we will wait and watch what could be the future reactions because we will have the parliamentary debates and discussions in fact we also have the finance minister who also said that we will have more debates and if it is not right we may also reduce as well as of now they are going to reduce it or not we have to wait and watch now let's look into the next article this article here is speaking about the Public Safety Act. Let us try and understand what is this Public Safety Act all about. We have one of the important articles in the Indian Constitution which is Article 22. Article 22 speaks about two types of detention. One is the punitive detention. The other happens to be preventive detention. What is this punitive detention? Let's say for example, there is a person who has committed an illegal offence or he has committed a heinous act. Let's say he has committed a murder or he has committed a rape, so on and so forth. Or it can be a dacoity, robbery, so on and so forth. So this person has committed an illegal act. They are able to prove it in the court of law. And after they are able to prove it in the court of law the court convicts him so this person's all the crimes have been proved and as a result the court convicts him he is thrown behind the bars so this is where punitive detention comes into picture where that person is punished for an offense committed by him after the trial and the conviction of the court so trial takes place and there is conviction of this particular person so he is thrown behind bars which is called as the punitive detention then we have something called as the preventive detention so what is this preventive detention this means detention of a person here trial does not take place there is no conviction of the court only because there is a suspicion that this person might commit an act in the near future that person is detained which is called as preventive detention so what is the difference in punitive detention a person is punished there is trial there is conviction of the court of law but in preventive detention no trial no conviction of by the court of law but this person is detained for a certain period of time because the executive feels that this person may commit an act in the near future so he is detained so the purpose is not to punish a person for the past offense but to prevent him from committing an offense in the near future who can make the laws for the preventive detention we have the parliament which can make the laws we also have the state legislature which can also make the laws as well where do we look at it we have the union list that is the list one under the seventh schedule we also have the concurrent list under the seventh schedule as well if you look into entry number 9 it says preventive detention for reasons connected with defense foreign affairs or the security of India for these areas which deals with defense foreign affairs and security of India only the parliament would be able to make the laws but at the same time there is concurrent list as well under entry 3 we have preventive detention for reasons connected with security of a state maintenance of public order or the maintenance of supply and services essential to the community so this 
basically means under list 3 concurrent list the state governments would also be able to make the laws and at the same time since it is in concurrent list the central government that is the parliament would also be able to make the laws as well so this clearly means that the parliament has a wide legislative jurisdiction in the matter of preventive detention this can be very important from the preliminary examination point of view what do we mean by it this means that the parliament would be able to make laws in these areas as well as those in the concurrent list which is why parliament has a wide legislative jurisdiction in the matter of preventive detention remember this can be important from the preliminary examination point of view now when you look into the preventive detention where do we have it we have it in article 22 let's understand what does article 22 speak about protection against arrest and detention in certain cases when we speak about preventive detention we have 22 of 4 22 of 5 22 of 6 and 7 which speaks about the preventive detention what does 22 of 4 say no law providing for the preventive detention shall authorize the detention of a person for a period longer than three months unless an advisory body consisting of persons who are or have been or qualified to be appointed as judges of a high court has reported before the expiration of the set period of three months that there in its opinion sufficient cause for the detention so detention can happen and if it is beyond three months this advisory body have to give permission so such a permission will have to be taken even before the expiry of the three months so this is 22 of 4 then we have 22 of 5 when any person is detained in pursuance of an order made under any law providing for preventive detention the authority making the order shall as soon as may be communicate to such person the grounds on which the order has been made and shall afford him the earliest opportunity of making a representation against the order let me simplify this clause for you let's say i am a person i may give a hate speech in the near future or i have given a hate speech in the past so the executive is under an apprehension that i may also give her hate speech in the near future which may vitiate the environment and as a result what what do they do they make sure that i am detained so the executive detained me but the minute i am detained i should be knowing on what grounds they have arrested me so they will tell me why have they arrested me in that particular case i would know what is the issue why i have been arrested why I have been detained as a clause of the preventive detention and at the same time i can also make a representation what do we mean by making a representation i can say no whatever you the executive is saying is wrong i did not make any such hate speech and i can also say i did not make an hate speech so you the executive will have to release me making a representation basically means that i am saying to the executive who have arrested me that i have not done this so i am complaining against this particular order so whom should i complain so what will happen so the minute i make this complaint to the executive the executive that is the government will immediately have to respond respond to me so they may look into it they may say you have done it or they may also say you haven't done it so the minute this happens it will go to the government the government will look into it and if it feels that i as a person should be detained i'll be detained further but if they feel that i have enough merit in my case in that case they may also allow me to come outside the detention center added to it if the government feels that i have to be behind the bars that is preventive detention should continue they can also put it before the advisory body as well so the advisory body if it feels that i have to be behind the bars as part of the preventive detention i will be detained but if the advisory board feels that i should not be i will be liberated from the jail that is what is clause 5 then we have clause 6 nothing in clause 5 shall require the authority making any such order as is referred to in the clause to disclose facts with such authority 
considers to be against the public interest to disclose so if they feel that it is against the public interest they need not have to give the information to me as well and the most important of all is what we have is 22 of 7 where the parliament may by law prescribe the circumstances under which the class or the classes of cases in which a person may be detained for a period longer than three months under any law providing for preventive detention without obtaining the opinion of the advisory board in accordance with the provisions of sub clause A of clause 4. What do we mean by it? If you look into clause 4, what does it say? It says that if a person has to be detained beyond 3 months, what we require is the permission from the advisory board. An exception to this is the 22 of 7 where they need not have to ask the advisory board where they can dispense with this particular advisory board and such a power is only given to the parliament. So the parliament can make the laws, the state legislature can make the laws but when it comes to dispensing the advisory board that particular permission is given only to the parliament. This can also be important from the preliminary examination point of view. So remember parliament can make laws, state legislature can make laws but we have the advisory body. So this advisory body or the advisory board if it has to be dispensed in that case power is given only to the parliament this is what is article 22 with respect to the prevention distinction is it constitutional or not yes it is constitutional Ankul Chandra Pradhan versus the Union of India is the landmark judgment of the Supreme Court which said that the object of the preventive detention is not to punish but to intercept to prevent the detainee from doing something prejudicial to the state the satisfaction of the concerned authority is a subjective satisfaction in such a manner says the Supreme Court of India why are we discussing about the preventive detention that is because the public safety act Act in Jammu and Kashmir happens to be a preventive detention law. Only if we understand what is preventive detention, we would be able to understand the Public Safety Act of Jammu and Kashmir. What is this Jammu and Kashmir Public Safety Act of 1978? This happens to be a preventive detention law under which a person is taken into custody to prevent him or her from committing an act which can be a problematic to the security of the state. This is is very similar to the National Security Act that is used by multiple state governments for the preventive detention. The act was introduced by the government of Sheikh Abdullah as a tough law to prevent the smuggling of timber and keep the smugglers out of circulation. So initially it was promulgated in 1978 by the Sheikh Abdullah government and it was brought into picture to prevent timber smuggling and keep the smugglers in prison. What are the features of this particular law? The PSA allows for the detention of a person without any formal charge, without trial. This is what we discussed with respect to preventive detention. It can be slapped on any single person who is already in the police custody or someone immediately after being granted by a court as well or even on a person acquitted by the court of law. And such a detention can go up to two years as well. So the PSA allows for the administrative detention for up to two years in, in the case of persons acting in any manner prejudicial to the security of the state and for administrative detention up to one year where any person is acting in any manner prejudicial to the maintenance of public order. So remember when it comes to the Public Safety Act, unlike in the police custody, a person who is detained under the PSA need not be produced before a magistrate within 24 hours of the detention. So who passes order under the Act and on what basis detention order under the PSA can be issued by the Divisional Commissioners or the District Magistrate. The detaining authority need not disclose any facts about the detention which it considers to be against the public interest or to disclose. So this basically means we will have the police officers, the police officers prepare a case file or a dossier against this person accused who has to be behind the bars as process of preventive detention and ultimately it is the deputy commissioner who
who will accept or reject the recommendation. If it is accepted, the district magistrate pass the detention order and in that case, this person will be detained as well. What happens when the PSA is implemented? We have to refer to section 13 of the Public Safety Act of 1978. When a person is detained in pursuance of a detention order, the authority making the order shall, as soon as may be, but ordinarily not later than five days and in exceptional circumstances and for reasons to be recorded in writing not later than 10 days from the date of the detention. So this basically means the district magistrate will have to communicate to the person within five days in writing the reason for the detention. In exceptional circumstances, the DM can also take 10 days to communicate these grounds and this communication is important because it is on the basis of this that a person is detained. So the DM also has the discretion not to disclose any of it under the public interest. So this is what happens with respect to the Public Safety Act. What has the Supreme Court of India said with respect to the Public Safety Act? Supreme Court has held that while detaining a person under the PSA, the DM is under a legal obligation to analyze all the circumstances and material before depriving that person of his or her personal liberty. It has also held that when a person is already under the police custody and he is slapped with the PSA, the DM has to give compelling reasons for detaining that particular person. So the DM can detain a person multiple times under the PSA but each time they have to give the fresh facts and ultimately it has to be in writing and all the material on the basis of which the detention order has been passed, the Supreme Court has held should be provided to the detained person for making an effective representation and the grounds of detention has to be explained, communicated to the person in the language under understood by the detained person. So this is important that person in the language, so whichever languages he understand, the same will have to be told to that person. If these are not followed by the DM, it can be made the ground before the High Court for quashing a detention order. This is the viewpoint of the Supreme Court and this is what is the Public Safety Act all about. Now let's look into the next article. This article says, who classifies monkeypox as the public health emergency? Because of the rapid spread of monkeypox in multiple countries, who has said that monkeypox will now be public health emergency of international concern? We will try and understand what is this public health emergency of international concern. This happens to be an extraordinary event event where it is not just limited to one country but it has started spreading to every other country. So the minute this announcement is made by the World Health Organization, it basically means an alarm to all the countries where they have to come up together to give a proper response to this particular disease. So the minute it is out, it means all the countries will have to collaborate on sharing the vaccines, treatment plans, so on and so forth. So this is a signal to all the countries that they should pay attention to the existing condition and contribute in a way that they wish to contribute. So the responsibility of declaring an event of emergency lies with the Director General of the World Health Organization and also requires the convening of the members of the committee. In the past, the World Health Organization has declared public health emergency for multiple outbreaks. This includes swine flu, polio, Ebola, COVID-19, so on and so forth. Why did the World Health Organization declare it so? That is because the World Health Organization said so far 14,533 probable and laboratory confirmed cases including three deaths in Nigeria and two in Central African Republic have been reported to World Health Organization from 72 countries across six World Health Organization regions up from 3,040 cases in 47 countries at the beginning of May 2022. The transmission was occurring in many countries that had not previously reported cases of monkeypox and the highest number of cases are currently reported from countries in the European region and the region of the Americas. The majority of reported cases of monkeypox currently are in males and most of these cases occur among males who identify themselves as gay, bisexual and other men who have sex with men in urban areas and are clustered in social and sexual networks. As a result, 
the World Health Organization feels that this should be brought under the public health emergency of international concern. What are the basis on which this particular tag is given? First, the information provided by countries, which in this case shows that this virus has spread rapidly to many countries that have not seen before. Second, the criteria for declaring a public health emergency of international concern, which have been met in the present situation. Third, the advice of the emergency committee will be taken into the picture. Fourth, the scientific principles, evidence and other relevant information will be considered by the World Health Organization. And finally, human health, international spread and the potential for interference with the international traffic will all be considered and ultimately this public health emergency of international concern tag will be given to this particular disease. So basically, we now have the World Health Organization which has given guidelines as well. First, those who have not yet reported a case of monkey pox or have not reported a case for more than 21 days. Second, to those who have recently imported cases of monkey pox and that are experiencing human to human transmission. Third, is for group of countries in those with transmission of monkey pox from animals to humans. And fourth, is countries with manufacturing capacity for vaccines and therapeutics. What is the impact of this notification? This may lead to restrictions on travel and trade. Countries may become cautious as well. And at the same time, what we will have is an international response to monkeypox in the present situation. It is this that we have to understand with respect to this article. Now, let's look into the next article. This article says, Unused new rules for disabled DGCA told. Let us try and understand what is this article all about. There was an incident on Indigo Airlines where a passenger with disability was denied boarding at Ranchi. So, this is where they violated some of the existing guidelines of the Directorate General of Civil Aviation. The Directorate General of Civil Aviation has one of the guidelines called as the carriage by air persons with disability and or persons with reduced mobility as per these guidelines once persons with disability or reduced mobility report at the airport with valid booking and intention to travel the airline shall assist to meet their particular needs and ensure their seamless travel from the departure terminal of the de departing airport up to the aircraft and at the end of the journey from the aircraft to the arrival terminal exit without any additional expenses. The guidelines also mandate that airlines, airport operators, security, customs and immigration bureau organizations at the airport should conduct training programs for all personnel engaged in passenger services to sensitize them about assisting persons with disability or reduced mobility and also alert them to eschew negative perceptions and attitudes towards such passengers. Despite these guidelines given by the Director General of Civil De Aviation, Indigo violated these guiding principles. As a result, we have the DGCA which has amended its rules on carriage of disabled persons and has said that all airlines cannot deny boarding to specially abled people without seeking the medical opinion of a doctor at the airport on a passenger's fitness to fly. So in case the airport doctors feel that they would be able to go, they should be allowed and these airlines cannot ban them, these airlines cannot stop them, says the DGCA. So what is the new amendment given by the DGCA? Airlines shall not refuse carriage of any person on the basis of disability. However, in case of an airline perceives that the health of such a passenger may deteriorate in flight, the said passenger will have to be examined by a doctor who shall categorically state the medical condition and whether the passenger is fit to fly or not. After obtaining the medical opinion, the airline shall take the appropriate call, says the amended rule book of the DGCA. This is where the article goes on to say that the revised rules of the Directorate General of Civil Aviation for the disabled passengers that require a doctor's opinion to permit them to fly is an insult to the injury as conflated disability and ill health must be rolled back says the disabilities right groups. So the DGCA's rule penalizes those who are atypical in appearance, communication or behavioral expression by acquiring additional screening by the average lay person or medical professional who has not been exposed or sensitized to the disability or even di human diversity of human experience says the disabled group. Basically these people who are at the 
airports they may not be knowing what are the issues that the disabled person may go through so if he rejects in that case the disabled person may not be able to travel via the aircraft and this is hurting their sentiments says the disabled group in fact we also have one of the landmark judgments of the supreme court of india in jija ghosh and another was the union of india and others jija ghosh happened to be a disability right activist and she traveled frequently and was deported from a spice jet flight in the year 2012 the crew on board noticed her drooling a bit and decided she is unfit for the travel so she goes to the supreme court of india so the supreme court gave the judgment in favor of jija ghosh and ultimately highlighted two important rights of the disabled travelers one is accessibility the other is reasonable accommodation if reasonable accommodation is not provided then there is violation of the disabled right said the supreme court of india so in this particular case of indigo once again the disabled rights were not respected and as a result the violation of article 21 to live with dignity says this article it is this that we have to understand with respect to this article now let's look into the next article this article says kerala researchers detect fungal disease in jackfruit so this article here is speaking about athelia roffsi this happens to be a fungal pathogen and this has currently impacted the jackfruit so remember athelia roffsi happens to be a fungal pathogen usually jackfruits are not infected by any of these pathogens but in the present situation there is a fungus and this fungus is called as athelia roffsi and this has impacted the jackfruit is all that you have to know with respect to this article so from the preliminary examination point of view you have to know that athelia roffsi is a fungus and this has impacted the jackfruit production in the state of kerala and this athelia roffsi is a soil borne fungal pathogen with a wide host range which attacks various commercially cultivated crops belonging to different families but this is the first time it is being reported in jackfruit in the country one disease which is found in immature jackfruit is the risopus fruit rot but it does not affect the mature fruit says this article now let's look into the next article this article says bat habitats in southwestern ghats lie mainly outside protected areas this article here is basically speaking about rising threats to the bat population the minute covid-19 came into picture there was an apprehension that all kinds of bats will infect the people and this will also lead to multiple zoonotic diseases as a result people do not want bats in and around them and they're going about killing these bats is the major point in this article so while bats like salim alis fruit bat continue to be hunted for their meat there are also been reports of people's attitude towards bat deteriorating since covid-19 pandemic due to misplaced concerns of having bat colonies near the human settlements people are increasingly coming to believe that the chances of them contracting zoonotic diseases increase due to the presence of bats near their homes further identifying these populations of bats outside protected areas could help conservation and at the same time they may have to spread awareness that it will not infect them or zoonotic diseases will not spread them is what is this article all about so basically it is about giving awareness to the people and making sure that these bats are not killed by the people that is all you have to know with respect to this article and this article also makes a reference to agastya malai periyar tiger reserve anna malai the nilgiris why not mudumalaya complex as well as the brahma which you have to remember from the preliminary examination point of view as part of the assignment you have to put on the comment section how many tiger reserves are present in the state of karnataka kerala as well as tamil nadu and put out which these tiger reserves are now let's look into the next article this article says how will supreme court ruling on abortion impact women this article here is speaking about abortion laws of india we have recorded a video for the same the link will be given in the description box so 
kindly look into it. Now let's look into the next article. This article says, Media Running Kangaroo Court says, CGI Ramana, this topic has again been discussed on 11th of July 2022, so kindly look into it. Now let's look into the main practice questions. Explain why prepackaged and labeled food items been brought under the tax net now. What is the Jammu and Kashmir's Public Safety Act? Discuss the constitutional safeguards against preventive detention. So please write all your answers on the comment section, peer review and do give positive feedback to your friends answers. So this is it for today. Thank you for watching. All the best.